Hello and welcome to this week's Bachelor Society talk on Black History Month. As you may know, the month of October has been designated as Black History Month since 1987 in the UK, it was a bit earlier in the US, and is a time in which people come together to celebrate the breadth and depth of black history and the contributions that individuals and groups have made to society. It was first organised in the UK by a Ghanaian activist called Akayabe Adai Sibo, and if I've mispronounced that name I can only apologise, who worked for Greater London Council at the time. He saw a growing identity crisis amongst black people in the UK and believed the creation of a national annual celebration of black history would help to solve this problem. The tagline for this year is dig deeper, look closer, think bigger. And the purpose of today's talk is to encourage you to do just that in relation to black history. How can you find out more? How can you find black voices in a historical period or a traditionally white narrative? Why might they have been ignored? And what wider historical trends does black history illustrate? But before we go any further, it's important to be honest with ourselves about how much we genuinely know about black history. Some of you may know a lot and some of you may know very little and that's okay. For example, how many of you could actually point to Ghana on a map as that is the country from which the first, the creator of Black History Month was from? All of you listening to this talk will have had history lessons about the slave trade and the British Empire, which reflect one particular aspect of black history at one particular point in time. It's fair to say that these two events or institutions do not represent black history as a whole. It is a varied and rich tapestry with many facets that show black contributions extending far beyond a historical lesson about how we shouldn't treat humanity. This, fundamentally, is why Black History Month has to exist. The depth of this type of history is often ignored and overshadowed by more dominating white European or colonial narratives. If I were to ask you to think of a famous nurse in history, chances are you would say Florence Nightingale rather than Mary Seacole as seen in the first picture in this slide. If I were to ask you to name a famous cricketer, chances are you'd say Ben Stokes, not Sir Leary Constantine. And if I was to ask you to name an MP or politician, chances are you might say someone like Boris Johnson rather than Diane Abbott. With that in mind, this batch of society is going to give you a snapshot into some key events in British black history and how important they were, as well as some recommendations for those of you who want to learn more. Firstly, when you think of black musicians, you might consider Drake, Aretha Franklin, Whitney Houston, or even Dave, but probably not John Blank, a Tudor trumpeter first recorded at the court of Henry VII. Little is known about his life, but he has been explored in a variety of model historical works, including Black Tudors by Miranda Kaufman. His presence is recorded twice on the Westminster Roll from 1511, which was a 60-foot-long manuscript depicting the lavish celebratory tournament held to commemorate the birth of a son of Catherine of Aragon and Henry VIII who unfortunately tragically died 10 days later. This manuscript shows him playing his instrument on horseback as part of the royal retinue and in royal livery, showing he was clearly an excellent musician. The purpose of pointing him out to you is to encourage you to look closer. To quote an article by David Olasoga, a highly recommended historian for those of you wanting to know more about black history, black people have had a presence in our history for centuries. Get over it. If we look a little closer at our history, stories like that of John Blank can be easily found. This is a new aspect of history being explored, so there may be even more unique stories to find. While we often focus on civil rights in the US at school, an equally as interesting and diverse a movement was taking place concurrently in the UK. Facing the same prejudices and discrimination against them, as seen on the signs which frequently appeared in the windows of homes signifying they were not welcome and equated with canines, as you can see in the first image on the slide. Having been encouraged to migrate to Britain in their thousands, the welcome they received was hostile and frankly not welcoming in any sense of the word. Just like in Montgomery, Alabama, the people of Bristol held a bus boycott in 1963. As a, though this time it was as a protest for the refusal of the Bristol Omnibus Company to employ black or Asian bus crews on the city's public transport. Students from Bristol University and well-known politicians of the time supported the movement and spoke up publicly against the ban on the employment of BAME workers. The boycott lasted for four months and resulted in the Bristol Omnibus Company overturning the colour bar, as well as two race relations acts passed in 1965 and 1968 respectively. Both of these acts made racial discrimination unlawful in public places and continued to encourage others to, can, to fight for real and lasting change in the law and societal attitudes. Sometimes the fight for change did result in violence, and it's important to understand why violence has been a key part and often unavoidable part of black history. Sometimes it's the only way for voices to be heard and coverage to be gained. 
Although it often divides spectators, it does mean that issues gain traction in the news. Moving back to the 1960s, I want to take you to the Mangrove Restaurant in Notting Hill. Founded in 1968 by Frank Critchlow, it became the place to go for black people in the local area as its menu catered to those missing their West Indian home cooking. It was also a haunt for celebrities of the era, including Bob Marley, Jimi Hendrix, Diana Ross, Marvin Gaye and Vanessa Redgrave, who all spoke highly of the cuisine and ambience of the restaurant. It rapidly became a community and a space for political discussion, which came to a head in 1968 when Frank was informed that he would be losing his licence to operate as an all-night cafe, thanks to Kensington and Chelsea Council. Frank believed that this decision was unlawful discrimination, as the council accused him of allowing prostitutes and criminals to frequent his cafe, which he strenuously denied and was known to be untrue by people in the local community. Police cars were stationed outside the restaurant every night, allowing for resentment to grow unchecked, especially as they continued to regularly raid the restaurant, despite finding no evidence of criminal activity. Inspired by the Black Panthers in the US, the Action Committee for the Defence of the Mangrove was formed and began preparing for a protest march. They felt this was the only option as even appeals to the PM through letters had yielded no results. One hundred and fifty protesters began their march past several police stations in the area following lots of discussion amongst those at the Mangrove restaurant and deciding this was their only solution. Whilst there were 150 protesters, over 700 police officers of various ranks were overseeing them in some capacity, which many thought was a slightly ridiculous overreaction. At the end of the protest did see violence break out, with many different accounts as to whose side of the fight. Several were injured and nine protesters were arrested and charged with incitement to riot and affray. The magistrate initially called for the charges to be dropped due to contradictory police statements, but they were reinstated and then are prepared to defend themselves at the Old Bailey. They were eventually acquitted of all charges, five of them in particular, and four received suspended sentences, but the judge remarked in his closing statement that it's clear that there is racial hatred on both sides, which became the first judicial acknowledgement of racism in the Met Police. As we know, this would not be the last. Although the Mangrove restaurant closed in 1992 and Frank passed away in 2010, the place on which the restaurant stood continues to be a, a symbol of black resistance supported by the descendants of the original nine. As a history teacher, I think students should learn about the events that took place around this small restaurant in West London. I doubt that many of you knew about it, and I hope that you will go away and share your new knowledge about it with others, friends, family, parents, whoever. While there are many parallels between the US and the UK civil rights movement, in terms of bus boycotts, protests and antagonism with the police, one should not be a part of the curriculum at the expense of the other. An interesting aside connected to the fight for civil rights is on this slide. Although the relationship between black people and many other ethnic minorities and the police continues to be a contentious in nature, the first black policeman in the UK was called Jack Kent and joined the force in 1835. Born the son of a formerly enslaved man called Thomas, he grew up in the Carlisle area, eventually marrying a local girl and having three children. He was first employed as a constable at Maryport, where he saved the life of a colleague in the early years of his career, something which he did throughout his time as an officer. On one occasion, in fact, John was threatened by three men, one with a knife, and was able to disarm them and ensure that all three were arrested. In helping to end election riots, he was also stoned in an episode which led to the death of another colleague. He had a colourful career without doubt, but, and the question of discrimination that he may or may not have suffered is an important one. He was referred to as Black Kent, but that might largely be to be expected given the time period, but you can see a um, reproduction of him surrounded by his white colleagues in this image. Overall, Jack was known as a man of propriety, and when he died, the newspapers reported that he was a notable of the community. Fun little aside for you there. <laughs> Lastly, in both world wars, black people made a significant contribution to the success of the Allied forces. One of the most celebrated black soldiers of World War I, Walter Tull, can be seen in the middle of this slide. He enlisted in December 1914, and throughout the war suffered from shell shock, fought at the Somme, was commissioned as an officer, and tragically was killed in battle in 1918. Walter was one of many men who answered the call the British government made to its colonies, travelling to Britain at their own expense. In total, in World War I, 15,204 men served in British regiments, a contribution that has often been overlooked. The number of those who served rapidly increased at the advent of the 20th century's Second World War. Around 600,000 African men were in the British army over those six years. They were as indispensable to the war effort as their white counterparts, 
Yet documents uncovered in 2019 showed that they were paid up to three times less than them based on, entirely on their ethnicity. This is something that's definitely been left out of the history books. There are plenty of ways for you to learn more about the experiences of black soldiers in World War I and II, and I would highly recommend you do so. This is only really a small snapshot into their history. I hope that as we move past the centenary of World War I and towards the same landmark for World War II, the contributions made by these men and women can come to be more valued and studied as part of the broader and more inclusive narrative about these wars that shape the world. Hopefully, this has given you a brief snapshot into some aspects of black history. It is by no means exhaustive and largely 20th century focused, and that was really for the sake of time. I wanted to cover topics that you all will have covered lower down the school, but from a different angle. If you would like to know more about events which preceded the 1900s, there are a wealth of books, TV shows, podcasts, etc, etc, that you can peruse at your leisure, some of which are illustrations on this slide. Most of them are focused on Britain, but there is obviously a wealth of material out there for black history across the world. This also might count as a plug for taking history A level, as we do study some key events in black history, slavery with both its establishment and emancipation in the US, as well as the US civil rights movement. As a department, we are looking at changing what students learn about in key stage three to include the UK civil rights movement and how that tallied or deviated from the movement in the US, for example. Ultimately, commemorating or celebrating Black History Month is not the denigration of the history of white people or other ethnic minorities. Other minorities also have their own months in which their history is celebrated, such as Southeast Asian History Month, which goes from mid-July to mid-August. It is all about adding to the history that we are already familiar with and diversifying perspectives on it. These types of events allow people to share stories, knowledge and resources to ensure that children and adults alike continue to be properly educated on key aspects of our past that may have gone largely unnoticed or been taught only superficially or through a specific and outdated lens. That is perhaps what makes the celebration of it so divisive. I'm sure many of you have seen this tweet from Sainsbury's and the polarised reactions that have been garnered from it. All I will say on that matter is that all historical perspectives should be bestowed with equal importance but until that happens, Black History Month and other celebrations of minority history should continue. Thank you for listening and please have any questions ready in the chat.